Good morning. Welcome to Youth Bible Fellowship and Junior High Sunday School. Uh, you can go ahead and think I'm a geek. That's fine. I have spent almost all day Saturday camped out in the book of Second Thessalonians, and now I'm in the office at about 9.30 at night recording this for you because this book is just so full of relevant teaching for our day, for you, and I can't wait to get in. And I don't know how many of you are going to watch this, uh, but even if you're the only one, this is for you because I love you, because God loves you, and because he has something to say to you in the book of Second Thessalonians. Now, I know last week a lot of people didn't make it very far into the video, so I'm going to try and give you some of the nuggets of truth, the summary right up front, but I hope you'll stick with me for this video on chapter 1 and then also a video on chapter 2 and on chapter 3. But here you go. If you want Second Thessalonians in a nutshell, it's this. The Bible Project summarizes it this way. What you hope for shapes what you live for. What you hope for shapes what you live for. Here's another way of putting that. When, when I live with the certain hope that I will be with Jesus forever, then what happens? We can think that pastors talk about eternity and the second coming of Jesus and judgment and all these things in the future and pay no attention to daily life. But the reason that we talk about all those things is because of the fact that all of those things, when we live in light of them, they affect who we are today, how we live today. So in chapter one, here it is. When I live with the certain hope that I will be with Jesus forever, then I can endure hardship. Now, we're not in the same kind of hardship that the Thessalonians were in 2 Thessalonians 1, but we sure are in a time of hardship right now. And the key to getting through that is to remember that today is not all we have. If the worst scenarios happen, if we are trusting in Jesus Christ, we have obeyed the gospel of Christ, as 2 Thessalonians 1 says, then we will be with him forever. We will know God. We will know Christ. We will marvel at him forever so that we don't have to give in to all of the anxiety of the hardship we're in right now, as tempting as that may be, we can set our sights on Jesus and we can get through this. And that's not something I'm just coming up with for a nice video. That's exactly what Second Thessalonians has to say to us. So without further ado, let me have you jump in to the first chapter of Second Thessalonians with the Bible Project. Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. So not long after Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians, he got a report about the Christians in Thessalonica, and that the problems he had addressed in that letter not only had continued, but had gotten worse. The persecutions had intensified, and the Thessalonian Christians had become confused and scared about the return of Jesus. So Paul sent off this short letter, which is designed to have three sections that address the three problems in this church. Paul first offers hope in the midst of their continued persecution, and then he offers clarity about the coming day of the Lord, and then finally he brings a really specific challenge to the idle, people who were refusing to work normal jobs. And the end of each of these sections is clearly marked by a short closing prayer. Paul opens with a thanksgiving prayer for the Thessalonians' continued faithfulness and love, and specifically for their endurance. He's learned that their Greek and Roman and perhaps even Jewish neighbors have intensified their persecution of these Christians. They're a religious minority facing violent oppression. And Paul's worried that they might give up on Jesus if it gets worse. So Paul reminds them, like he did in the first letter, that their suffering because of being associated with Jesus, it's a way of participating in God's kingdom. Jesus was inaugurated as king by his suffering on the cross, and so his followers will show their victory over the world by imitating Jesus' nonviolence and patient endurance. Paul also reminds them that this won't last forever. When Jesus returns, he will bring his justice to bear on those that have oppressed them and shed the blood of the innocent. Specifically, he says that their punishment is to be banished away from the face of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Paul does not speculate here on the fate of those who reject Jesus, except to say that throughout their lives they wanted nothing to do with Jesus, and in the end, they get what they want. Relational distance from their creator and their king. 
And for Paul, this is the ultimate tragedy, to choose separation from Jesus, who is the source of all life and love, is to embrace one's own undoing. He closes this thought by praying that God would use their suffering to bring about deep character change inside of them so that their lives would bring honor to the name of Jesus. Paul then moves on to address a specific issue related to the return. Sorry, let me stop you there. Uh, let's take a look in this first video. I said we just do chapter one in this first video. You see the context up here. Things have gotten worse for the Thessalonians. Uh, Paul had written them in 1 Thessalonians, and a lot of what they were going through, it's still happening, and it's even worse. They're going through hardship, and they're going through confusion. Uh, here's their present, and here they're confused about the future. Paul begins with this Thanksgiving prayer, which is almost identical to that that he gave in the book of 1 Thessalonians. He notices their faith. He notices their love. He notices their endurance. Uh, they were a little uh, shy about the fact that Paul praised them in the first book, 1 Thessalonians. So he points out that it's only right if you were to read the chapter. There's only 12 verses. Go ahead and read the chapter. You'll find that Paul has to tell them it's okay. It's only right that I praise God and I commend you for what's going on. Your faith is increasing. Your love is increasing. You're enduring. Faith and love were things he had prayed for for them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And God answered those prayers. So, of course, he's going to praise God and note it. And all of this is in the face of the fact that persecution has intensified. How are they going to get through it? They're going to remember that they are a part of God's kingdom. They are Jesus' followers. And they will be victorious over the hardship by following Jesus' example, but more so by keeping their eyes open on him and on his return when he will bring justice and first Thessal I'm sorry second Thessalonians chapter 1 points out that this justice he will bring justice both to those who are persecuting he's going to bring judgment and punishment on them and he uses some really strong language punishment by God punishment including everlasting destruction um, I'll say it gently, I, I'm not sure I can get on board with what the Bible Project says here that Paul's not speculating about the fate of those who turn from Jesus. Uh, but I want to say that softly. You, you read it yourself and take a look and see if that language makes sense. But he does note later that the ultimate tragedy, and the Bible Project guys do a great job of noting this, is that they do not have the hope that they will be with the Lord forever, seeing his glory. Uh, first, Second Thessalonians 1, I'm sorry, says, talks about Jesus' majesty, his glory, his magnificence. We're going to bask in his presence forever and no joy unparalleled to anything we've ever experienced in this world. Because that justice also will bring final relief to God's people. So, going back, I live with the certain hope that I will be with Jesus forever. And because of that, I can endure this hardship. Now, these who are, in some cases, the perpetrators of our suffering, 2 Thessalonians 1 says two things about some others which may overlap with this group. They do not know God. That is, not that they don't know about God, they do not know God. There is no relationship with them. There's no knowledge like I know my wife or I know my children. And they are not obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they are not trusting in Him, repenting and trusting in Him for the forgiveness of their sins. If you've done that, my friend, then you have a certain hope that you will be with Jesus forever. And his Holy Spirit lives inside of you and is testifying to that so that in the midst of this present hardship, focus on Jesus and you're going to be with him forever. And therefore, you don't have to worry about right now. Now, Paul closes with a prayer. He does this for each of the three chapters, reminding us that all of life is to be punctuated by prayer. And I'll leave it to you to see the beauty of that prayer because uh, there are some 
nuggets of wisdom in there that we don't talk about very often, and I'd love to hear from you if you can find them in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. But you see here that a summary is that the Lord Jesus would be honored in and through us. I hope that you're getting something already out of 2 Thessalonians 1, and I hope to see you back for chapter 2 in just a little bit.